When you think of the PlayStation 2, most likely you'll be thinking of all the great games the console has to offer. Final Fantasy, Gran Turismo, and the list goes on. But did you know Sony officially released Linux for the PS2 and even went so far as to classify the console as a personal computer? So today, I'm going to show you just that, how you can turn your PS2 into a personal computer. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Tito and welcome to Macho Nacho Productions. Today we'll be taking a look at an interesting and pretty rare software package that Sony officially released for the PlayStation 2. So 20 years ago in 2002, just a couple years after the PS2's launch, Sony released a Linux kit for the console. In addition to the actual Linux software discs, the kit included a PS2 branded mouse, keyboard, a 40 gigabyte hard drive, the network adapter, and a special VGA cable to hook it up to a computer monitor. And interestingly enough, the Linux kit was the only official software that utilized this rather unique VGA cable. When using Linux on the PS2, you actually needed a monitor that accepted an RGB signal with sync on green. This requirement was an a ubiquitous feature on a lot of the computer monitors of the day, and Sony apparently had a list of recommended VGA monitors that were compatible. Thankfully, I have a workaround for this, which I'll get into a bit later. So even though the Linux kit came with a bunch of stuff to turn the PS2 into a personal computer, really all you needed were the discs. A lot of the other stuff, like the mouse and keyboard, you can actually simply use readily available generic non-Sony alternatives. It's actually pretty difficult and rather expensive to get the entire Linux kit. They show up occasionally on eBay, but they command a pretty high price. I mean, the Linux software by itself wasn't cheap either. So instead of hunting down and spending a tiny fortune on a complete Linux kit, I just bought this. This is the Japanese version of Linux for the PS2. I found the Japanese version to be the more readily available option out there, but there is also a North American and PAL version as well. Anyway, interestingly enough, the auction I won not only included the official release 1.0, but also a beta version as well. And when doing a bit of research online, I found an archived press release from a Linux convention, which states that the beta Linux software package was a limited release, of which only about 8,000 were produced. Now, I'm not sure if this is the beta version they were referring to, but I still think it's pretty neat to have. Anyway, having these DVDs in my possession now, I caught myself wondering who these kits were made for. From what I understand, these kits were great for programming hobbyists and was a great platform for learning your way around Linux for newcomers. Anyway, since I don't have the full kit, I need to supplement all the other components with stuff I already have on hand. First, I'll of course need a keyboard and mouse. For the keyboard, I'll be using my wireless 10 keyless Philco mechanical keyboard, which does also have a USB mini port so I can plug it directly to the PS2. For the mouse, I have this cheap Logitech M100, which is actually optical and not ball driven like the one that came with the original Linux kit. Now, in order to install Linux, we'll of course also need a hard drive. I actually wanna see if we can install it onto a SSD. So I have this 500 gigabyte SATA SSD connected to this aftermarket SATA compatible network adapter. However, from what I understand, Linux for the PS2 can be pretty picky when it comes to the hardware you're using. So I also have an official Sony network adapter with an official IDE hard drive that came with the North American version of Final Fantasy XI. I'm hoping that in case the SSD doesn't work, the official Sony stuff will. And because this kit does require a hard drive, it is unfortunately not compatible with slim model PS2s. Anyway, with the hard drive squared away, that leaves one more item that the original Linux kit came with, and that is the PS2 VGA cable. Unfortunately, there isn't just some readily available alternative or aftermarket equivalent. On top of that, official Sony ones are extremely rare and typically are only included in auctions that contain the whole Linux kit. And to add insult to injury, you need a monitor that can handle RGB with sync on green. So the question remains, how do we get the RGB with sync on green signal from our Linux PS2 onto this standard HDMI computer monitor? Well, to figure that out, I reached out to Bob of RetroRGB, and he knew exactly what to do. He even sent over a couple converter boxes and cables, but said the easiest option would be to use an open source scan converter, or OSSC. So I used this as an excuse to buy one of my own and try it out. And spoiler alert, it works incredibly well and is super easy to use. 
The OSSC is certainly a powerful tool, and Bob has a great video going over its basic setup and functionality, which is definitely worth watching if you're interested in this device. I'll leave a link to it down below. Anyway, I'll be using a HD RetroVision component cable to connect the PS2 to the OSSC, and an HDMI cable to connect it to my monitor. So with the video processing handled, that leaves just two more items I need. First is a standard 8 megabyte memory card, which will be used to boot into Linux, and of course, a PS2 console. Here, I have a beautiful blue 39,000 unit, but as you can see here, it is a Japanese model. This is needed because, if you remember, I have the Japanese region Linux DVDs, which will only work on a Japanese system. Unfortunately, Sony made PS2's region locked, so if you have a North American version of Linux, you can of course use that on your North American model PS2. All right, so now that we have everything in hand, let's set it all up. First, I'll install the SSD into the PS2, then connect the keyboard and mouse to the two USB ports in the front of the console. I'll then connect the PS2 to the OSSC using the HD RetroVision component cables and the OSSC to my monitor using an HDMI cable. All that's left to do is insert the memory card and then boot it up. Man, I love that sound. It gets me every time. So even before we get started, I have some bad news. I wasn't able to get Linux installed on the SSD. Every time I tried, I got a blank screen and then was returned to the runtime environment with an error message saying Linux PS2 could not be started. So unfortunately for those who wanted to use an aftermarket SATA adapter and SSD, I don't think you'll be able to get it working. But no worries. Thankfully, I have an official Sony network adapter and hard drive. So let's go ahead and put that into the PS2 and start over. So to begin, go ahead and insert disk one. Once we're in the runtime environment, you'll notice that there is sort of a pinkish tint on screen. To remedy this, we simply need to press the RGSB button on the OSSC remote for the AV2 input, which is where our component cables are connected. Now that the OSSC knows what signal is coming from the PS2, we get a perfectly rendered image on screen. Okay, now the fun begins. On screen, you see we have three options, install, boot, and rescue. This is pretty straightforward, so we're going to go ahead and select install. Now it's asking us to change the disk. This is something that will happen many times, so I just recommend leaving the disks easily accessible at all times. See, now it's asking to put in disk 1 again. Now it's asking us about language. I'll of course choose English, but it's pretty cool that even though this is a Japanese release of the software, we can select an array of languages. Then it asks to select keyboard layout, so I'll select US since I have a standard US layout. And then, yet again, it asks us to switch the disk. After waiting a few moments, we are greeted with a welcome screen. It gives us some instructions, saying that the installation process is outlined in the user manual but of course, this is unfortunately all in Japanese. Regardless, let's hit OK and move forward. Now it's asking what type of system we want. And in our case, we'll select Install Window Maker Workstation, the first option, which is a graphical desktop environment for Linux. We're not really interested in the other two options, so make sure Window Maker is selected, then hit OK. Now we need to set up the hard drive. Here it's asking which tool we want to use for the setup process. It recommends Disk Druid since it should be easier to follow along, so let's go ahead and do that. Huh, here it says the partition table on the hard drive is corrupted and that we need to create a new partition, resulting in the loss of all data. Since I really don't have anything installed on the hard drive, I don't mind formatting it, so let's go ahead and select Initialize. Here we can see that we don't have any partitions. To set up Linux, we'll need to set up at least two, a swap, and a native partition. So let's first set up the Linux swap partition. We can leave everything as is on screen, just make sure to select Linux swap. Then select OK. Next we're going to add our native partition, which will be the primary drive. 
For this, I'll be using the remainder of the hard drive capacity for this partition. In the mount point field, add a forward slash. And then make sure the grow to fill HDD is selected as well as the Linux native option. Once your settings look like this, hit OK. And then hit OK again on this screen. When prompted to save changes, select Yes. Then on the Choose Partition to Format prompt, hit OK again. Now it asks you to create a host name. Let's do something simple, Macho Nacho. And then hit OK. I'm not going to do the network configuration, so just tab down and hit OK again. Here it asks you for the time zone, which for me is the east coast of the United States. And here it asks you to set up a root password. I'm just going to do something simple here and then confirm it and hit OK. Now it asks to set up a username and password, so I'll go ahead and do that quickly and then hit OK. On the next screen, just hit OK again. I'm not going to change anything on the authentication configuration screen, so let's hit OK. Now it'll start to spool up the hard drive and read the disk. On the next prompt, press OK. And on this prompt, it states that Linux needs a memory card in order to boot up. So hit OK and then press Yes on the next prompt. And finally, here it states that the installation is about to begin. Press OK and we're good to go. Now this whole process can take up to around 25 to 30 minutes to complete, so I suggest getting up and stretching a little bit in the meantime. Once done, it asks you to insert your memory card. Since mine is already installed, go ahead and press OK to continue. After about a minute, you get a window congratulating you on successfully installing Linux. It says to press Enter, then Insert Disk 1, and then reset the console. So press Enter, and then give it a couple minutes. Once you're on this screen, go ahead and insert Disk 1. Then press the reset button. Don't mind the green tint on screen, because remember my OSSC is still set to sync on green, so everything will look fine once Linux is loaded. Okay, now we're back to the runtime environment screen, but this time we can select boot. Here you can see we have a couple boot options, but just go ahead and select memory card. Let it load, and here you can see it running through the boot sequence. After that's done, it prompts you for your username, so just type it in. Then it asks you for your password. Once logged in, in order to open the Window Maker graphical interface, type in Start X and hit Enter. And we're in. We have Linux running on our PS2 and the mouse is working and everything. This is just so cool. The PS2 is literally a desktop PC now. So this is my first time installing Linux on any machine ever, and the first time actually using Linux. So I am by no means an expert on the software. But regardless, it's still really awesome. Anyway, now that we're in Window Maker, let's take a look around. By right-clicking on the desktop, we get a menu which lists all the applications. Under the Graphics category, we have an application called GIMP, which may sound familiar because it is something that still exists today. This is an open source drawing utility, kind of like a more advanced version of Paint. Apparently, we need to install it, so let's go ahead and do that quickly. Now, I have to say, I have no experience at all with GIMP, but let's see if we can draw something interesting. Okay, so that's my very sad attempt at drawing the Macho Nacho logo. This is pretty neat, but let's see what else we can do. Right-clicking again on the desktop, if we go down to Appearance, Background, then Images, we can customize our desktop. Pretty neat. Another application is something called File Runner. This appears to be a graphical file management application, kind of like Windows Explorer. 
Going back to the menu, we have a category called editors with several applications listed. The first one is Emacs, which is a text editor. Nothing crazy and it works just fine. Another text editor that's available is MG Edit. Again, nothing to write home about, no pun intended. I guess the equivalent application in Microsoft Windows would be Notepad. All right, so I'm not gonna go over every application pre-installed since that would make this video pretty long, but I think this gives you a general sense as to what it's like using Linux on the PS2. Now, if you wanted to get more applications, you can actually hook the PS2 up to the internet and download some old applications from the archived PS2 Linux website. The website is pretty much dead, having been closed for over a decade, but you can still view everything and even download some of the old hosted applications. Okay, one of the last things I wanna do is check out some of the system information. Looking at the info panel, we can see that we're running version 0.61.1 of Windowmaker. Just for reference, I looked up the current version of the software, which is 0.95.9, released in April of 2020. So it's pretty neat that this graphical interface is still in use and getting regular updates. Additionally, you can access the digital user manual, which I'm sure would come in handy if you were actually serious about using the PS2 as a computer. Which brings me to what I actually think about Linux on the PS2. And to be honest, I think it's pretty awesome. I mean, back in 2002, this may have been a viable Linux machine for personal computing. It had a pretty robust community supporting it, and there were a lot of folks making cool applications for it. However, from what I understand, one of the big drawbacks of the PS2's hardware is its very limited amount of RAM. The PS2 has about 32 megabytes only. I mean, it really did struggle to run some of the applications, such as GIMP. As for me, I won't get any particular use out of it, but just the idea of having the PS2 double as a desktop computer, I think is very, very cool. So yeah, Linux on the PlayStation 2 is pretty awesome. I think it was kind of forward thinking of Sony to offer such a kit to the community. And I just have to ask if any of you watching actually used this back in the day and for what purpose? Did you actually code any software to run on the machine or did you use it as a regular desktop computer? I'd be very curious to know who out there actually used this. So there you have it, Linux on the PlayStation 2 just a very cool piece of PlayStation history. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all again next Thursday.